The AT assessment is a fundamental tool used to provide a quick assessment for a patient who is critically ill. It follows an order going through the potential life-threatening problems, giving priority to the most severe issues. All right, so the A stands for airway. And what we're doing here is basically checking that there's no obstruction, but also evaluating the likelihood that the patient will be able to maintain the airway if they deteriorate further. There are several things you can do to assess the airway. You can watch the patient and look for signs of an obstruction, such as paradoxical chest or abdomen movements, cyanosis, which is a blue discoloration of the skin, or use of the accessory muscles. You can also listen for sounds. For example, if the patient is talking, that's a fairly conclusive sign that the airway isn't obstructed. However, if you hear sounds like stridor, which is a high-pitched sound, mostly in inspiration, or even a wheeze, these sounds are indicative of a partial obstruction. So what happens if you hear nothing? You'll either have to try and hear the breath sounds using a stethoscope, or you'll have to try and feel for it. The way you do this is by putting your hand or your ear next to the patient's nose or mouth and feeling for the airflow. Causes of an airway obstruction include the patient's tongue, a foreign body, swelling, and even fluids such as vomiting or blood. So what do we do about it? Well, if it's obstructed, the patient can rapidly deteriorate and die or suffer hypoxic damage to organs such as the brain and the heart. So the first thing you do is you get help. Depending on the cause, the patient may be moved into the recovery position, so on their side. You may perform movers like back slaps or the abdominal thrusts in order to help dislodge a foreign body. It's possible that you use devices to prevent the tongue from obstructing the epiglottis, or you can intubate the patient. Oxygen is also usually given. B is for breathing, so we're looking at how well is the patient ventilating. A normal respiratory rate is between 12 and 20 breaths per minute. Higher than 25 is a marker that the patient may deteriorate quickly. We would also look at the depth and the effort of the breathing. Are they using the accessory muscles? Is the chest expansion symmetrical? Is the trachea displaced? Or is there hyperresonance? Investigations include the use of a pulse oximeter, so measuring the oxygen saturation. Generally, we aim for 94 to 95% with a minimum of 88%. However, you need to be careful in COPD patients not to overdo the oxygen therapy because you can end up suppressing their breathing. Life-threatening causes of breathing issues include acute severe asthma, pulmonary edema, and tension pneumothorax. The treatment, again, depends on the cause. Oxygen is given in most cases. If no obstruction is present, then non-invasive ventilation is another option. A tension pneumothorax would need needle decompression, which is done at the second intercostal space at the midclavicular line. Next, we have C for circulation, which we assess after we've evaluated the airway and the breathing. Here, we're assessing the cardiac output, so how well is the body being perfused? Two big indicators are the blood pressure and also the heart rate. Often, a low blood pressure and tachycardia are indicators that a patient may be deteriorating towards shock. Other markers include the capillary refill time, where you squeeze a fingertip for five seconds and look for how quickly the white color turns back to red. A normal CRT is under two seconds. Other parameters that you may look at include the temperature and also, if the patient is catheterized, the urine output. The main causes for a circulation failure involve shock. Shock can be a hypovolemic shock, for example, due to hemorrhage. It can be a cardiogenic shock from causes such as infarction or an arrhythmia. It can also be an obstructive form of shock, which is seen with things like pulmonary embolisms. You can also have distributive shock, seen in sepsis and in anaphylaxis. You do need to remember that in surgical patients, always keep a hemorrhage on your list of differentials. Just like the other sections, the treatment depends on the underlying cause. Generally, 14 to 16 gauge intravenous cannulae are inserted and routine hematological, biochemical, coagulation and microbiological investigations are performed, as well as a cross match for potential transfusion. Following this, IV fluids are given, 500 milliliters of 0.9% sodium chloride or Hartmann solution, also known as Ringer's lactate, 
can be given over 15 minutes. In patients who have cardiac failure, generally this is done either slower or less fluid is given. We're now on to D, which stands for disability. This is where you assess the neurological status of the patient, including their consciousness, by using initially the AVPU system, followed by the Glasgow Coma Scale for a more in-depth look. The AVPU stands for awake, responding to voice, responding to pain, or unresponsive. Additionally, pupil reactions and blood glucose levels should also be assessed. Management includes checking for drug-induced causes of an altered consciousness, as well as the other causes listed in the AEIOU TIPS mnemonic. Patients who are hypoglycemic are generally given a 50 milliliter initial dose of 10% glucose solution, followed by subsequent doses every minute until either the patient regains consciousness or 250 milliliters has been given. Finally, we reach E for exposure, meaning that complete exposure of the patient may be required to fully investigate. But of course, you need to maintain the dignity of the patient. E also involves looking for skin rashes, pressure wounds and skin changes, as well as an assessment for DVT, deep vein thrombosis. This is based on risk factors the patient may have. These risk factors can include obesity, immobility, and don't forget the surgical patients here, pregnancy, smoking, cancer, use of the oral contraceptive pill, and some inherited factors. Also consider whether or not this patient has been prescribed anti-embolic prophylaxis prior to this episode.